Hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the P3 podcast. This week, we've got a fantastic guest, Martin of Fire MBE. If you've not seen it, get on YouTube. Just type in <laughs> Martin of Fire and see some of his highlights reel from his rugby league career. And if, if not even that, these days, get on Instagram and Facebook because the videos over the last week alone will show you what this guy was all about on the rugby pitch. And the one I saw yesterday, Martin, welcome, by the way, 10 yeah. tries in one match. I know. Um, people would think that is, would be the highlight of my career, but um, I didn't even win Man of the Match that day. I think Dean Bell was my centre, or one of the centres who played in that game. I think he scored a hat-trick. And I just always thought that, you know, if you score 10 tries, you uh, automatically win Man of the Match. And I, I tried to uh, post it on Twitter, but I couldn't. I put it on Facebook, uh, the video, because I did another podcast with, the, I think, the Rugby League guru in Australia. And so he, uh, you know, packaged it up and I... And I thought I'd, I'd post on socials, but um, uh, the clip was too long to put on um, to put on Twitter. So I thought <laughs> I put a little post on. You, you're doing all right when your when your highlight reel from one game is too long to put on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you did get it up, maybe uh, Twitter would have censored it or something. Mark this. Is this actually real? Is this fake news? Did somebody actually score ten tries in one match? Is that possible? <laughs> I know. I, I think one of the, the quotes I put on when I put it on LinkedIn that was that uh, you know, if I um, if I didn't actually do it, I probably wouldn't have believed it could happen. You know what I mean? It's like uh, I always think to myself when you, people do great things. You know, if you take the likes of you know Michael Jordan out of this world, and then you take all of his his accomplishments out, and then you know we are a poorer place for it, and then people you know will actually won't believe you know certain things can actually be done because until things are actually done then we sometimes don't believe they can actually be done, you know, and it, it's crazy. And um, as I say, um, you know, I always believe sometimes it's, it's the hardest thing is to astound yourself. It's easy to astound other people, but the hardest thing is to actually astound yourself. And even when I, you know, see the, see, you know, the clips like that again, I sometimes think to myself, I have to pinch myself and think, was that really me to actually do those things? And yeah, it's crazy. And, you know, I'm talking like this is like, you know, 20 plus years ago. <laughs> 30 years ago even nearly and uh, when I was doing some of the things um, but yeah you know I always think um, you know when you do things that stand the test of time and they actually do mean something well the obvious question to ask I think if it was 20 20 years ago was has, has anybody done it since um, no I think uh, Sean Edwards was the only person in the modern era who's actually uh, scored 10 tries in a game and he did that against Swinton but, um, you know, to do it in a competitive match, you know, it was a semi-final of a premiership in, on a, in front of a packed crowd at Central Park. Um, I think, um, you know, the commentator at the end of the clip, if you go onto my LinkedIn or, or, or um, Instagram page, you see it. And he says, you know, like, in come decades uh, to come, you know, people probably still be saying that, um, you know, I was there that day. Because when you experience something like that, you know, if you're there, you know, I'm fortunate enough to, to have seen Michael Jordan play in the flesh. I've seen, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have seen um, Floyd Mayweather fight in the flesh, you know, and th those are things that you'll never forget, you know, and if you can create something which, you know, lasts the test of time, I always feel that, you know, you can forget careers, but you can't forget moments. And if you can create a moment that stands the test of time, then you're doing pretty well. Obviously, I've had a few moments, you know, the, the one that probably people think stands out, you know, is obviously me scoring that try at Wembley in 94, where, you know, Alan Tate was, um, you know, my, my support cast. Having, you know, if I didn't run around him, then, um, you know, I wouldn't probably have a statue at Wembley. But, uh, yeah, you, you, there's a few things in my career that, that stand out. As I say, I've been retired now longer than I played. You know, I've been re retired for 18 years. I think my career was only 15 years long. And, um, you know, you're only at the pinnacle of that career for a specific time. And, you know, if you can um, uh, create some great things, you know, in, in that time, then, as I say, you know, long after you, you're gone, you know, the statues, you know, the memories that you've created get handed down from generation to generation and, uh, you know, they can become iconic. Absolutely. And as you were, as you were chatting there, I was thinking of, I don't know, somebody in Leeds or Wigan, you know, a, a parent or grandparent seeing that pop up during this, you know, these difficult times of 2020 and calling the kids and grandkids over and go, hey, watch this. I was there. I was there when this happened, you know, and it's undoubtedly that's going to be happened just by the power of social media now. Um, going back into, you know, your mindset when, when you were playing rugby, was it, was everything just sort of 
automatic or were you or were you sort of really conscious of having the the right sort of physical and mental approach to the way you played um it, it might have seen seemed automatic like most things you know like when you, you know when you get up to speed when you get into the zone and then but you're always pushing but you're always pushing and um that's the thing about mindset it, it, it's it's a it's a constantly evolving thing and, and even when you retire it's a constantly evolving thing you know you've heard it said many times it's not something you can switch off you have to you have to change that direction or get into something new but you can't be that type of person and suddenly think I've retired, so I'm going to switch that off. And you know, and, and it, it can it can be um, uh, a blessing as well as a curse, as, as many sportsmen have found. If you don't, you know, find the right path for it, or you know, the right environment for it. But when I was playing, it was a constantly evolving and searching thing. You know, I don't know where it came from, but it was within me as a child. You know, maybe it was just the the components that made up. The environment that I was in, everything clicked, you know, from the fact that maybe I, I came from humble beginnings, you know, that I was the youngest of three. I was always trying to be as good as my my elder siblings who were far more intelligent than me. My, my parents were cerebral. I was, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, um, um, uh, you know, chronically challenged, you know, <laughs> I didn't have the, the greatest brain um, um in, in this world, but I was always striving to, 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 to get better and, and to be better. And so whatever uh, environment I was in, you know, I wanted to be the best that I could be just to be noticed, uh, I think. And that, that's where it came from. And I always thought to myself when I was playing, you know, if I could do something crazy, I could not be denied. You know, if I just thought, you know, if people say I was a rubbish rugby player, if I did something that no one else has ever done, then um, I could not be denied. And even when I was playing, uh, I think um, in one of the podcasts that I did, you know, we talked about how I was, when I went from rugby union to rugby league, I was described as a uncoordinated clown, you know what I mean? And those things, you know, they, 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 they kind of, you know, pinched you a little bit, but, you know, they inspired you uh, when, when people said things like that. And, uh, you know, because you didn't like it, you know, if I'm honest, it hurt, it stung a little bit, you know, I'll, I'll show them, you know what I mean? When people abused me racially and, you know, and, and got negative reactions from, you know, sometimes 20 plus thousand people uh, in a packed stadium, you know, I thought, you know, I'm going I'm to show them, I'm going to, so I think there's lots of things that I think kind of fueled it, you know, looking back. Um, and I think they, they made me the person who, who I am. And who I was, and I think that's what made me successful. I just think I was always felt like I, I was battling. Um, don't get me wrong; I enjoyed scoring tries, and you know, the, there's lots of different things that go into the mix. And I probably have to be um, um, dissected by a shrink to get to you know <laughs> the core of uh, my being. I know I, I wrote a book about um, scoring tries called Fifty of the Best, and I always think to myself, you know, it's a book that not a lot of people know about. Yeah, you know, it's a book that some rugby players have read, but I was always of that opinion now because I probably didn't read as much as I, I could uh, uh, when I was younger. And if I could go back and speak to my younger self, I would say to myself, read even more because I know that I learned a lot from watching other players and seeing what other players did and then adding my own twist to it. And I always think to myself that I've written a book about scoring tries. I'm thinking that if I if I knew that there was someone who'd scored more tries than anybody and actually written a book about it, I'd want to read that book. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, and that's, that's the kind of mindset that I was at. You know, I was, I was, I went to, 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 to sprinters. So I thought if I could learn to become the best sprinter that I could be, when I came to compete with rugby players, I'd be in a class of my own because I didn't have to beat professional sprinters. I just had to be in the same ballpark. When I was 20, I remember going to an athletics club and spending the whole summer before I went to play rugby league. And that really helped me. And you know, what I mean, I, I've I've beaten European um, indoor two hundred meter um, champions. I've beaten four hundred meter athletes who have been international athletes. You know, at, at, in races, I'm thinking if you can do that, and then you're going to take that speed, um, and then and put it in a rugby environment. You know, early on, I was of that mindset, and at that time in the eighties, there you know there weren't sportsmen with that. You know, what I mean, now you have training camps. You know, you have um, ice baths, they've got, you know, hydrotherapy chambers, they've got, you know, weight rooms, they've got all, you know, um, wrestling coaches, they've got all these things in one environment for people to be successful. That's why they have training camps now. Back in my day, we didn't have that. 
You know, I had to go to athletics clubs, I had to go to boxing clubs, I had to go to all these things and seek that. And I'm thinking, who told me to do that? You know, I, that's, I don't know where that came from, but that was, you know, that was just why, that's why I, I said, you know, sometimes I felt like I had the cheat code. I was going into games and I was going into clubs with a physical talent, which I felt was as superior as anybody else, with mindset, which I thought was, you know, far superior because the people I was competing against probably didn't have, I didn't feel I had my desire and background because they didn't have all the, the experience, all the things that I experienced, take, taking all the negatives and turning them into positives, you know, going to grounds, knowing I was going to get racially abused and people were going to look at me differently. But I thought it was a positive, like I was going to stand out. I didn't have to stand out. I stood out, you know, it was easy. And all I had to do was do that and puff my chest out and be proud and, and walk with a certain swagger that that was going to piss people. I knew that was going to piss people off, you know, but I embraced that because I knew then I had to perform because it was a, it was a, you know, it was a gladiatorial environment. And, uh, you know, I always likened it going back to the Colosseums, Colosseums of Rome that I always think to myself, when those gladiators retired from that environment, they still must have thought to themselves, you know, I miss those days, you know, because it, it's a tremendous buzz, isn't it, to have your life on the line, to, to be in that environment and to thrive on it. And they must have thought, God, you know, I miss those days. And people feel, oh, it's, that's crazy. How could you miss, you know, putting your life on the line? How, how can you miss being in that environment, that harsh environment where people, you know, literally obeying, you know, that bait of breath, they just want to attack you and kill you out. And I said, no, because in that environment, I thrived. You know, I was a success. Uh, I've got so many great things. And there's many stories of going in, into big games, even in 1994, going into the Challenge Cup final then, you know, after having such a, a great start to my Wigan experience in 92 when I was bought for half a million pounds, scored 10 tries in a game, went to, to Australia, was the man of a match in the Sydney uh, Sevens for Wigan. When we won that, we beat the, the world. We were the best in the world to the lows of in 93, to going back up and people saying, uh, you know, people don't realise on the eve of that final, when I scored that try, there was a full size story in the Daily Mirror. And I've kept it to this day and it's on my Instagram page. You can see it. And it's a big poster of me, which finished on the top of it. And I went into that 994 final with that. And it's, a, it's ironic because Alex Murphy, the guy who wrote the, the story, is actually one of the run players on the statue with me outside Wembley. So we're going to be joined now for eternity. You know what I mean? When I tell stories like that and I go into that final thinking this, people saying I'm finished. And I always thought it's quite funny that they've got a big poster of me. So I thought if anyone likes me, then they like to have a poster of me. They don't want finished on the top of it. So I just thought that is the most in incredibly crazy thing. And to this day, I've never really sort of sp spoke to Alex about it, but I know, you know, in this modern world, it's clickbait, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, it's getting people enticing to a story but I'm thinking I've been signed for half a million pounds I've done all these great things I've been the top try scorer for four seasons the four seasons I was at witness I was signed for half a million I've done all these things that no other run player do, has done and still I'm going into one of the biggest games of my life and they're saying I'm finished I'm the best of a bad bunch so that is the most and I, I two years earlier I'd won the the the, the Lance Todd which is the the man, the match at the at, at Wembley final, done these great things. I thought to myself, that's what I was going into. I thought I've got an opportunity in front of 80,000 people to create something. Because it was more to me than winning. Just winning and winning. People can't understand how I said to them how depressed I was on the, on the um, coach on the way back from the 1992 final. And people were saying to me, Martin, you've just been signed for half a million. You've scored 35 tries in half a season. You nearly became the top try scorer in the competition after only playing. Because I had to sit out the first, first half of the season because I was in dispute. You've won the man the match. You've done this. You know, you, you proved all the doubt was wrong. I said, no, I'm not happy because I didn't do what I wanted to do. I was all about legacy. I was on, about, I was on a different plane to, to people because most people say they'll be satisfied by that. And that's I was not one of those sportsmen who you classically hear after games and you hear a lot in football. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm happy. Uh, you know, I didn't score, but, you know, the team won. Because I was not of that opinion. I thought, if the team won and I didn't do what I was meant to do, surely what am I doing there? How do I justify being there? Surely next week they're going to get somebody else to do my position because if the team can still win and I don't do what I'm going to do, if you get someone in to do what I can do and actually does it, 
then the team's going to be better because that's the mindset that I, I was up. I just wanted to go out and win. So I was not happy. I was literally sulking on the bus and people could not understand it. But that's why in 94, when I went to my knee, I put my, you know, my, my head in my hands because I'd actually thought, you know, I, I'd done it. I'd done, I felt like I'd done what I set out to achieve. I, I set out to do something that I thought that would stand the test of time. You know, I, I wanted to actually score a hat-trick <laughs> in that game. And Robbie Paul went on to do that, I think, two years later in 1996. But, you know, I just thought to myself, I've done something. I've done something. I've actually said to myself, I could not believe what I'd, I'd done it. And that's another thing, you know, when you, you know, it is down to not only you, because you can be great, you could have trained hard, you can have done everything right, but still to achieve that thing on that given day, it is more than you. And I think that's why sportsmen do that. That's why, because they know that you can do everything you want to do. You could have a whole career of doing the right thing, going to bed early, um, eating the right foods, training hard, but still you have to have that certain thing. That's why they call it greatness. It's tangible. That's why they say you are blessed, you are all these things, because still you worship because it is more than you because there are many great people who have got great talent who have worked hard, but they still don't get that moment. You know what I mean? There's some great people, you know, even Joan Lohman never won a World Cup, arguably, you know, the most transcendent, you know, sportsman from the rugby field. And he's never won a World Cup. You took, his, you are... took his name out of my mouth then. Yeah, but there are some people who, there are some people who we won't remember their names but they may have won one, two, three World Cups. You know what I mean? So to get that, to be that, you know, that person, to be Floyd Mayweather, to be Michael Jordan, to have everything come along, to be Johnny Wilkerson, to have that moment in any sport and field where you do that moment, you create it. Uh, you know, that is that is why you give thanks. And because you were healthy that day, you didn't have a cold. Um, you know, the, the person who you're opponent was two steps to the left instead of two steps to the right those minuscule things that help you create that thing of beauty and when you've done it and I think to myself man I'm blessed to have that mo one moment and that was my moment and, and to say I'm I've scored 10 tries in a game and people don't know about that you know what I mean so much if you say to if you say to people Martin of Fire, have you heard of him? And people go, yeah, what's the thought, first thought that's going to come into your mind? Everyone's going to say that try at Wembley. There's a statue after it, and there's bars named after it at Wembley. But I've done greater things. You know, the, you know, I've scored a try for witness against um, Wigan in uh, 1989, which is probably arguably the best try that I've ever scored. You know, I've scored five or six tries on many times. I've scored hat-tricks in the Sydney Football Stadium. All these things I talk about are on YouTube. I've done so many great things. But it's just that one moment that is remembered for that one single try. That is not the greatest thing that I've ever done. I always think it's funny. In the first season that I played rugby league, I won this thing called the Man of Steel, which is uh, the award given to, you know, arguably the best player of the season. When I only scored 42 tries in that season, I wasn't particularly good. And I, you know, as I say, I've probably been the top try scorer for six or seven seasons, scored more tries, done greater things, but I've never won it. Why? You know what I mean? I, I, to this day, I don't understand it. I've scored 10 tries a game, never won the man of match. So you can do all these things which you think are great, but then like, it's just that one time, that one moment, all the stars align and you create something which means so much to other people. It means so much to you. It's on a big stage. There's crowds. People buy into it. They build statues of it. There's bars. And then you go pass through Wembley Stadium. There's pictures of me in the pose. As, uh, I think I was with Brian Robson um, after a Man United final. And I was with a, a friend of mine and his little son. And we're just randomly walking through um, Wembley Stadium. And, uh, and I, we walked past a picture of me you know, I think I was uh, celebrating that try. And we took a picture of myself. I'm a big Man United fan, Brian Robson and my mate's son. And, you know, and he's got, my mate's got that picture. And I've seen that. And, you know, things like that just mean so much. And it's just because it happens. You can't necessarily, you can work as hard as you want to in this world, but you can't create a moment like that because it just happens. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And some things in life happen organically and, that's why the, the, the beauty I, I like, I love about life, I love about sport. You can work so hard for moments like that and they may or may not happen, even though you are giving it 110%. And so all you can do is do that and hope that you create something like that. And that, that is, that is it in a nutshell for me. And, and sometimes that's hard because it's not fair. It's not, not right. You know, there might be some people who are, 
maybe better than some other people, but they don't probably get the plaudits that they deserve for some reason. You know, there's lots of people who might say that Michael Jordan's the greatest player or Kobe Bryant is, is the greatest player, but sometimes the styles just align. Yeah, and if that. you are in that position and they align for you, that's why I jumped to mind. People will say, what were you thinking at the time? And, you know, our whole discussion that we've, um, uh, you know, discussed today and more, I can put that into that moment and all, everything I spoke today it's encompassed in that moment when you go down to your knees and how can you describe all that in a moment? It's just tough. It's just tough. But anyone who's experienced that or anything like that knows what I'm talking about. There's a, there's a few things I want to unpack from that. So um, it dawned on me a little bit, that newspaper article saying finished the morning of that game, maybe they were premeditating the fact that you were going to finish off that move on that run. You definitely finished that. That's for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, there is. You can take so many things out of life. And that's the, what, the beauty of life. You can take from it what you want. You know, it's, I, I liken it to like someone, you know, someone writes a great song and, you know, no one knows the true meaning behind that song unless you speak to the person who wrote the song and you know what's in that head. But that song can mean so many different things to so many different people. And life and sport are like that, you know, um, Two managers can do exactly the same, so or sorry, two managers can get exactly the same results, but do exactly the different things, you know. And and when they're successful, you know, like we used to call the Alex Ferguson factor, didn't we? You know, because he's so successful for such a long time, he can literally say what he likes, and people <laughs> will buy into it. But if someone else can do exactly the same thing, and it doesn't work for them. You know, some people are blessed. You know, Mourinho's the chosen one. He's winning everywhere. <laughs> you know, he's won everywhere he's been. He's even winning at the moment at Tottenham. And, uh, you know, he, they say he's the chosen one. And, and, and you know, and it's kind of funny because you don't really want to buy into that because people, you know, are all about, it is about hard work. It is about this. It is about that. It is about everything. And that is all very well true. But still, you know, you have to have that, certain thing as well which you can't you know put yeah. your hand on and that's why you are blessed if you have it you know it's being in the zone it's it's what working all those hours doing everything that you have to do but then still being blessed to be in that right moment in that right company with those people you know the, be the right coaches the right parents good or bad mind you it doesn't always have to be good and positive it can be a parent that beat you it can be uh uh, you know, a master that believed in you or a master that didn't believe in you because it's not what happens to you in your life, it's how you react to the things that happen to you in your life and everyone knows that, good or bad and that's why it's open to everyone you know, some people have parents who, who help them, you know I, 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 as a parent, I'm totally different to my, to my parents, you know because my kids, I help them uh, I fund all their passions I drive them everywhere I buy them the equipment that they need you know, but you know, that can be either a help or a hindrance, you know. If someone had done that for me, I may not have been successful. I needed, an, you know, a, a negative environment maybe to, to thrive in, you know. I, I, you know, I love my parents, but, you know, <laughs> I had to fight them to do what I wanted, you know. Maybe that's what, that meant that for me to to um, to do that, it had to mean more. I had to go against my parents, you know. I, I, I literally left home to actually go to Hong Kong to play the Hong Kong Sevens in 1987. Because my mum said I had... I couldn't go. And I thought, no, this is my path. I really have to do that. And so I fell out with my parents, but maybe I needed that. She said I could go. Then maybe, you know, I would have went, but I maybe didn't, wouldn't have played so hard because I knew that when I was in Hong Kong, I better make something of this because I burnt them bridges. You know what I mean? I knew that when I was going home, I was going home to sleep on my mate's floor, you know, which I had to do before I let my one back in so that mindset you know I had to if I went out there that with my mum's blessing she gave me money to go um she said you know mine when you come back there's going to be you know uh, I'll be a big hug and, and waiting for you maybe I wouldn't have, have been so much but I just knew that I had to do something you know and I got the opportunity to go out there and play against the All Blacks as an unknown and that competition really opened me up because all of a sudden I came back from Hong Kong you know England didn't used to send them um, um there was a big, I don't know if you know about the history of rugby, there was a big divide in rugby back in the, the, um, the late 80s, uh, early 90s, whereas the Southern Hemisphere were on the road to professionalism. But, you know, Will Carling famously made that quote about 
the old farts and, 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 you know, they wanted to keep it at the status quo in the Northern, Northern Hemisphere. And so they didn't send international teams to, to competitions like the, you know, the Hong Kong Seven. So I had to just go out there with a uh, invitational side called the Penguins. And uh, so we, so I went out there and I just thought this is an opportunity, you know, to play against the All Blacks as an unknown, to play against Australia. Uh, we beat, I remember we beat um, uh, West, Western Samoa as they were back then in the semi-final. I got to play against a current All Black winger called Terry Wright and, 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 and to score in that game and to, to play well and to get my picture taken with the all, current All Black team. I was actually in awe to be in that environment. And I didn't get opportunity. I didn't, I never had an opportunity like that to do that. So when I came back, you know, I got picked to play for the Bar Bars. I also got picked to play for England, England um, students. I got picked to play for, for the, the London division against the North uh, in a final um, rugby union trial for the first World Cup in 87. Didn't get picked to play for England, but rugby league scouts were seeing me. And all of a sudden I got this opportunity. I didn't know that that was going to be my, my break. But, you know, I was just, it was just the stars aligning for me at that time. You know, everything, I was in that, that time, I was just in that moment at that time. And I was doing the best that I was doing in my journey. And that's why people always say, don't they? Have, have faith. Because yeah. sometimes you have to have faith. But I think, I think some, what, what's really standing out from you, Martin, is there's, there's, there's a word coming out and it, it keeps replaying in my mind, it is your hunger for, for it, you know, whatever that was, you know, hunger for, for success. And success could be um, playing at the highest level I possibly can or proving myself or proving my parents wrong or I want to go and play at the highest possible standard, you know, at the Hong Kong Sevens, for example. Um, but what I think has to happen, though, is for the stars are always aligning, but you have to put yourself in alignment with them. You have to do something. You have to be proactive. If you're waiting for them to come to you, somebody will get there first. Is that something that sort of rings true with you? Absolutely. I Because you don't know when it's going to happen. That's what I'm saying. That's why you have to have faith. Because it could be today or it could be tomorrow. Or, you know, it, I'm a firm believer that, that is that it can't, it can't be um, uh, absolutely destiny for everyone. Because life does not work like that. You know, we can't all be millionaires. We can't all be um, the world's greatest basketball player. We are, all, can't all be the world's greatest um, rugby player and we and we don't know what's in the future that's why yeah. that's why it is faith because it's going to happen you just don't know when it's going to happen and some people give up the yeah. day you know as they there's lots of that's why when you see all these um uh old wives tales or whatever that you had they are so true yeah. you know it is darkest before the dawn you know what i mean you do have to have faith and and, and, and that's why all the things that they do, everything just becomes mm. crystal clear. Once you've reached that promised land, everything becomes crystal clear then, and it, everything, life just seems to make sense. Yeah, you know? and there's a, there's a big message there, and especially if there's any youngsters listening to this that are obviously looking to get into sport or already you know, playing league, union, football, whatever. I think one of the biggest things there is, is being, being consistent and being grounded. So being consistent with your performance, being consistent with your drive to improve, um, but also being grounded along the way. And opportunities will come, again, if you keep the faith. I want to I wanna dig a little bit deeper into that, Martin, in terms of your, your consciousness, in terms of your your awareness in terms of your performance when you were playing. So if you if we ask somebody, you know, rugby league fan, how would you describe Martin O'Fire, the rugby league player? They'd probably say rapid, gas, ridiculously quick. But it, that, that's not enough from my experience in sport. So I'm, I'm thinking of timing of the run, execution of the run, timing of the catching, the angle of the run, the step, when you choose to put the hammer down, slowing down to speed up. There's so many things, reading the opposition, knowing where your support players are. And a lot of this can't be a conscious decision, in the moment, because you haven't got time. It's all your experience, all your training, everything coming to fruition, that alignment you were talking about, in the moment. So it's, it's not good enough being quick. Anybody could be quick. That's why that's why um, Usain Bolt doesn't matter as a footballer. It, you know, it's not all about being a quick winger, is it? How, how conscious aware in the match were you when you were doing it, but also in preparation? Um, that's a great question. And you just summed up my whole rugby career. And it's everything, isn't it? Everything in your life always builds up to that one moment. You've heard it many times, you know, when like before an Olympic final, you know, when you have that moment and you think about, you know, when you were a kid and how you started off and of that, and it all, it's all that, it's all a learning process to that one moment, be it a World Cup final, be it an Olympic final, be it a Challenge Cup final. And it's just, it's just everything layer on layer on layer. And then, you know, and everything slows down. You know, the best way to, to describe it is like, you know, whether it's learning to drive or, you know, 
when you first start in the mirror signal, mirror signal manoeuvre, and then you go from that to doing what, you know, someone like Lewis Hamilton does, you know, at the top of it. It's just like everything. You've got to realise that on a rugby pitch, there are only so many things that can happen. When you think about it, you can go there, that can happen, that can happen. And I was very a visual person. And I used to see things and I used to tell myself, I know what's going to happen now. He's going to go there. That's going to happen there. I just need to get there. And that's why I used to say, I think I've got the cheat code. I've worked it out. Yeah. And obviously, if speed was that, the only thing that, because um, people, a lot of people, obviously, who are less um, well-versed with sport, just go, oh, yeah, Martin Fire, he was quick. And, yeah, and that's why. And I, I hear it now, Martin Fire, he could play rugby. He was just fast. I'm saying, if that was a quick, if that was the case, then everybody who's fast is going to be a good rugby player. I, I've seen uh, Dwayne Chambers uh, play rugby league for, for a game once. I remember, I think Sky sent me to, um, um, uh, you know, look over his game and critique his his match uh, when he uh, obviously was going through, the, you know, the drugs ban and he was playing for Castleford. And I saw him, you know, I think he's chasing a kick downfield, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen on a rugby pitch. And then somebody just sidestepped him and he fell over and he... he because he, he, he didn't know what he was doing. And, and uh, you know, th but there have been some great sprinters who've gone on to be really good rugby players, like Nigel Walker, uh, who was an international, I think, hurdler, sprint hurdler. Yeah, that's right. Went to play uh, uh, for Wales and, and got quite a few caps. But yeah, there is more t to it than that. Obviously, you know, it, it's like at Wembley, I'm just, I, I can remember it as if it was yesterday, you know what I mean? That, you know, knowing that Alan Tate is somebody that I played against, knowing, Alan Tate's uh, attributes, you know, knowing that, you know, the, the relationships that we used to have and the things that they used to say and how he used to always um, dare anyone to take him on the outside because he knew that he had the beating of most people because if he showed them the outside and they tried to take it, then he would mow them down. Yeah. I was one step ahead of, ahead of Alan Tate. That's why I go, I'm saying that I'm faster than Alan Tate. So basically I had a race with Alan Tate, but I said, go. That's basically yeah. what basically what I was doing with him in my mind, I was playing tricks with him, you know, I used to say to him, when I, you know, if you read my book, 50 of the, of, of the best, you know, I talk about 50 of the greatest tries, not all my own tries, but the tries that I'd watched and what I'd learned from them, watching people like Ellery Hanley, who was not as fast as me, but could still score tries from a great length. And what I learned from him, how I knew that when you were a sprinter, you don't sprint for the line, you let the line come to you, knowing that when you're sprinting and somebody's behind you, if you run as fast as that person, then you get to line. You don't, when you're in front of somebody, you don't have to run faster than, they have to run faster than you to catch you. Just learning simple things like that, which people may or may not know. And uh, being in situations, and there's so much knowledge and brains that you go into just doing something like that. You know, when you see someone like, you know, things I've learned from sprint training, when you accelerate coast, accelerate coast, that is anyone who's a sprinter would know what I'm talking about. That is a basic sprinting drill. Yeah. When you sprint for hundred meters, you accelerate, you coast for a bit, you dig in again, you coast for a bit and you dig in again. That is just a, a simple uh, sprint drill that all sprinters do. Uh, but maybe rugby players don't know about that because you can't just sprint the whole length of the, the field, be really quick and really hammer it. And that's what you see it many times that like you see someone sprinting and you'll watch their faces on a rugby pitch. And don't forget, you've got a ball in hand and that person's got, hasn't got a ball. So you have to take that into a factor because when you're in the, the, the when you're in the um, 100 meter file or Usain Bolt hasn't got a ball under his arm, but obviously I've perfected the art of sprinting with a ball because I've run with a ball for a lot of my life, you know? So if you're coming to the game late, you put a ball in a sprinter's arm, then that's going to upset their balance and they're not going to be able to sprint as well. So just, as, you know, I could talk to you for 10 hours and I still wouldn't get everything that I was in, that I had to use into that try, into that game. You know, even think, and when you have that brain in that moment, and there's certain things that you organically think in the moment as well. I remember if you go back and look in YouTube as well, after scoring that try in 94, which then was played on the BBC every year until, uh, you know, uh, till, till this day. And I even knew on the pitch in 99, imagine this, right? And this is a true story, because I remember this, right? In the 99 Challenge Cup final, I played for London against Leeds. And there's a break. And uh, I think John Timu, who's my centre, kicks the ball. And this is me, this is me in, the, in that moment, in that pitch. I'm thinking, I'm going to get the, the ball. And I imagine that in the moment, I've got another fallback. I'm in a similar situation, not quite the same, but similar situation. And uh, Yesin Harris is the fullback for Leeds. And I'm thinking, in that moment, I'm thinking, 
he's probably watched that game. He doesn't want to be another Alan Tate. He doesn't, because Alan Tate is ridiculed now forever because he let me go on the outside of him. People always say, why to Alan Tate to this day? Why do you let Martin Fire go on the outside of you? Imagine that. And I'm in that moment and I'm thinking, he's obviously seen that. He doesn't want to be another Alan Tate. So I do exactly the same thing and just go inside him. And that is like, and sometimes I, and that's when I stand myself and I'm thinking, wow. Even to this day, I think about like, how did I think that? But it's just, it just natural to me. And I think when you're thinking at that level, that's greatness. That's, that's what gets you above levels. Is anyone going to think that? Got to think in the moment that you're playing against somebody, you're thinking how old he is. He's definitely seen that try. He does, and he knows how people ridicule Alan Tate. He doesn't want to be another Alan Tate. So I was about, almost like, said it to him, like with my body went, I've got to go outside and went inside and I scored. We still ended up losing that game, but you know, that was still the first try. And I'm thinking that just puts into psyche the things that I, I used to do. And I was thinking to myself, that there's so many, so many things that can happen. There's so many, so many pictures you can create. Right. And uh, knowing that, you know, if I stay on my left wing, there's only so many tries that I can score. And that is all the tries that are going to be scored between the sticks and the, and the left hand uh, flag. So I thought to myself, if I can work out to be everywhere, as I am in those 10 tries, if you go to see those 10 tries, to look how many tries I scored on the left side, look how many tries I scored under the post, and look how many tries I scored between the sticks and the, the right hand corner flag. And that's the only way you can create something like that is by by risking it and trying to be everywhere. And sometimes you'll get it wrong, but I thought if I ever get it right, I was always gonna score a silly amount of tries. I didn't think I was gonna score 10 tries in one game. Well, I learned that from watching people like Sean Edwards, because Sean Edwards used to, he, as I say, he scored 10 tries in a game and against uh, Swindon, uh, Swinton, I think it was, and he was just inside. So he can get all the tries, he's running inside support. So he can get all the tries that scored that down that way and he can get all the tries scored down that side. So I thought to myself, I can do what Sean Edwards can do. He can't do what I can do. He can't score the tries that I can score because he hasn't got the physical gifts. So that's why I said, I've got the brains. I can, I can learn. I can see what he can do. I can copy. You know, great as you, you know, greatness is easy to, 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 to copy. You just have to spend time at it. People it. always say that um, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. You know, all these things, all these little sayings, you just take them and you put them together and you add it to what you've got. That's how, you, obviously, you've got to have the physical gifts and, the, the, you know, to be able to do the job. But then you just take what you've got, you add it to what everyone else has got. You know, you, you read things here, you see things here, and you just, you know, I, I wish I, I did have a, a, a journal and write these things down because I always believe that you shouldn't use your, your brain as a filing cabinet because you miss out on so much. But, you know, through repetition and so I, I learned quite a lot. And that's what I was able to, to do, the things I, I did. And, but I still feel I was lucky that I was able to, to still achieve them. Yeah, brilliant. And I think, you know, I asked the question about, you know, how conscious were you in the moment? And the answer is very conscious. You know, if you're oh, making yeah. that, that yeah. split second decision in the moment, clear as day, to the point where 20 odd years later, you can remember making that decision, that yeah. is being very conscious in the moment. And I think sometimes, sometimes we can, our brain, our brain can play tricks on us. So sometimes we overthink things, so we end up doing nothing. Yep. Uh, and other times we don't think about it at all and we let our, you know, the automatic response kick in, which is great as an instinct, but it doesn't always serve us right. Yep. Um, because then we've got to, if it's not serving us, we've got to think about it consciously to take the learnings from it. Yep. And I think, I think that's a great little segue into the next topic I want to talk about. So there's undoubt, undoubtedly the fact, you know, that you've had a hugely successful career across both codes of rugby. Um, and you've actually brought back a memory of... Um, watching the Hong Kong Sevens, John Olumu went there one of his first years. And I don't know if you remember this, where he did a one-arm javelin pass, the width of the pitch. Yes, do you remember, remember that? I remember yeah. that scene. I'm like, oh my God, that's that iconic moment of doing some, something completely different. Um, but this success, you know, it, sometimes it comes at a cost. Has, has there been a cost to you? Oh, without a doubt, definitely. You know, he... I, I played so much rugby in my early career and I, I was just, I was always wanted to play. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to earn money. I wanted to do all the things that I wanted to do that, you know, it came a, a, a cost physically, mentally and physically in, the, in terms of my body. I did, don't think I had a, 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 even an off season off, you know, every, from uh, the, I think the year I left school in 85 till 1995 was my first holiday. So that's a lot of life I, I was miss, missing out on, on life experiences. And, you know, you, you, it, it is a, you know, um, a trade-off. You know, people, people say it now, don't you? You know, you have to make sacrifices. But how, many, how much sacrifice 
do you want to make? And that's why at 90, at, in 1995, I think that's when I thought to myself, it doesn't matter how many more Challenge Cups I win. It doesn't matter how many tries I score. You know, I want to live. I want to go on holiday. I want to create some other memories. I want to, you know, have children. I want to go out and do things that I, a lot of other boys were doing at 19, you know, you know, go and let my hair down because life is about finding balance. And so I found out that you do too much. There is a cost. There is a cost, you know, of be it your childhood, be it relationships, be it that is. And, and are you prepared to risk that? But, you know, I am, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, sorry. I'm, I'm glad that I did that because I think to do that, I created something, you know, and I think life is, is for living, but there's a long times to do, you know, the more negative things, whether that's drinking, whether that's, you know, partying, doing the things that a lot of sports are, I don't want to, you know, go down yeah. that, because I would say things that, <laughs> let's not really keep, keep up for another podcast. <laughs> podcast, but, you know, you know, any human being, you know, knows there are other um, pleasures out there, which, which people want to indulge in. And, and that, that was really it. You know, I think it took someone who I, I knew, but didn't know that well, was getting to know who passed away at the beginning of their journey, which made me think up and think, you know, there is more to life than being successful and, um, you know, being the greatest in the world. So, so what, you know, you, you're the greatest in the world. So what you've got statues, there is, if you just spent your whole life doing that and then you didn't actually go and have fun with your mates in, in Vegas, create those kind of memories, you know, yeah. uh, take your kids to Disneyland. Um, you know, I'm taking my, my, my family, you know, who have never been, I've been to Dubai for the last eight years. And, um, you know, obviously this, for the for the Hong for the not Hong Kong seven by seven yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been every year with the, the joining Jack team. It's been some great times, and my family have been. I always said, "Oh, Dad, you never get to. I'm getting to take them to, to Dubai." You know, living life to the fullest is is part of life as well. Just as much as being successful or earning money or doing whatever, it's making the most of what you have in your life, and that's something that I didn't learn early on in my career. Maybe I learned at the right time. It's something I do now is trying to get that sustainability in life. You no. Know, to having that role, and that's hard, a very fine dividing line to get balance in your life, isn't it? It's very hard, yeah. you know, too much play, not enough work, you know, all these things, you know, you know, too much work, you know, makes Jack a dull boy or whatever the saying used to be, you know, all these little things, they are so true, but you know, it's only when you've experienced them, you understand them because before you experience them, they're just words, you know, mm. if I say to my, <laughs> they're just words. And when, because you, you have that life experience and you, and you, you have your, um, your foot to the metal, you know, you get to experience, experience those things. And I always say it's better to be on that path and have the negatives of, of too much work because you, sooner or later you will wake up and realize, you know, that too much of striving. I, I, I had an, another interesting conversation, you know, th these are things, the lives, experiences that you can't buy. You know, I'm sitting in Buckingham Palace, waiting to collect my MBE, <laughs> sat next to Steve Redgrave who's going to collect a CBE. And we're talking about stuff, you know, and we're talking about, you know, being driven and whatever, and, and why, you know, the reason why he went to so many Olympics and uh, had to do it, because he couldn't, couldn't turn it off, you know, and to get to learn from people. You know, when you meet, when I meet people who are success, I always try and take a little bit from them. You know, if I'm having a conversation, if you get, if you ever get to meet someone who's who's achieved anything, don't waste that time. Just get to answer them one question and not a silly question, but one question which you think that I can draw something from that person, you know what I mean, out of them. And uh, you understand the psyche and why you do things. It's because you have, because he has to, there is nothing else for him to do. You know what I mean? Because if you, if he just went to one Olympics and then didn't go back to another one, you know, what's he, what else is he going to do? He's just going to, when you reach that mountain top, unless you go back down and, and try and either climb a higher one or climb it again, climb it faster, or do something else, then you you allow negative things to happen in your life. You know what I mean? It is, you know, the devil does, how, you know, you don't have to be religious, but the devil makes work for idle hands or however you want to play in. Yeah. You have to keep moving because if you stand still, don't care whether you're Michael Jackson or whoever, and you've you've come, you've got the world. You, you know, if you stand, stay still. Bad things can happen. Negative thoughts come in. Uh, you know, you, you go down a bad path. You know, that's why people often spend the first half of their life achieving, and then the second half of their life giving it away. Why do you? Because all you can't live off consumption. If I've got ten billion pounds and all I just keep going down around is spending, spending, spending. That's not going to give me joy and happiness, is it? No, but not if at I all. can actually 
do and then go give to an orphanage, build one of these things here, or use it to create something even bigger, or do something, you know what I mean? It's like, that's that's the only thing that can happen. That's And when people get that and understand that, they can continue to have benefit in their lives. And that's why as a sportsman, once you retire, doesn't matter how great I am, right? <laughs> doesn't matter how many statues I've got, doesn't matter how many awards I've got, how many knighthoods you've got. You know, once your career's over, it's over. You have to look for something new and you can't live off the rest of your life with someone saying how great you were. You know what I mean? It's like, I get it now. People say, it, doesn't, oh, it doesn't pay the bills eventually, other does it? It gets to a point where people won't pay for it. It doesn't bring you, it's nice it's, you know, for that five seconds. Of, oh yeah, you're really great. I remember watching you, but how many times can someone say that? You have to find yeah. something else, don't you? You have to find, you know, that's why I'm into what I'm in now. I'm into sustainability. I'm into, you know, EV charge. I'm into something. No matter what it is, it's just yeah. a new journey. Something that I'm going to struggle at. I may be successful at. I may not be successful at, but it's a new journey I'm on. It's like when, when I was playing and people say, what is the, you know, what, what gave me the greatest joy? And I often say, trying to become what I've become. That is what has given me the greatest joy. And so now it's trying to do something else. You know, if I can actually, um, I'm a big Man United fan. If I can actually be part of the team that is is in stores, in EV charges into to Old Trafford, I'll be buzzing off that. You know what I mean? I, I found a new thing. I found a, something else to get excited about that I may or may not achieve. But it's not, I, I realise that in life, it's not about achieving things. It's about trying to achieve things because that's the most enjoyable journey when I see my kids now and they always say they're going to be better than you you know one's good at rugby one's good at football I always just say to them you know this is the best part of your life being on that journey once that journey is over that's when it's over it might be at 16 when they kick you out of the academy and you have to go and look for a job it might be at 22 when you didn't um give it your all you got one professional contract and you 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 got kicked out then, or maybe at 28, when you've had three professional contracts, but you've got a, an injury, and then it's all over to you then. It might be at 35, when you've had a full career, and you took, and, you, and then you're, you're playing for a, a lower club because you know the big club you're playing got rid of you, and you're thinking about the next stage of your life. You know, we're all on this journey, and it doesn't matter whether you get, you know, on the, a football, rugby, sporting journey, business journey, whatever journey you're at, but all you do is you get onto another, journey and you and you carry on again and that's yeah. and that is the beauty of life you can always do something else you know or set new goals and do anything but you have to keep doing that or else it becomes life becomes boring or people you know they're in the rut and they? they got to this job and they got to manager level and they can't be bothered anymore because it's too much effort to go and study more to go on to the next thing you're better off just quitting your job and then going doing something different, you know, getting a bit of money and go and do something different. Keep always moving forward because that's how you, you have true happiness. It's just, everyone, I always liken it to a journey. You know, when you're going on a journey, it doesn't matter whether you're just going from, you know, Manchester to Singapore or London to, to you know, London to uh, Warsaw. You know, if you're, if you're in a traffic jam on that journey, that's going to be the most frustrating part of your journey. You're going, no, actually going nowhere. But even if the journey's longer, but you're sailing along, you're listening to some tunes, you're with your mates, you're having a great time. You know what I mean? You don't care if the journey takes half as long, you know, twice as long, three times as long, because you're having a great time on that journey. There's nothing worse, isn't it, than standing in, staying in the same place too long. Yeah, that's, for sure. That's something that you learn. You've always got to be pushing pushing forward, doing stuff, learning stuff, getting, using all these skills and, and, and praying, having faith that it all works out for you. Brilliant, man. Some wise, wise words there. Uh, what, before we come on to, you know, what you're on now, what, you, what you're up to now and what, what the future holds for you, I want to I wanna play something sort of back to you a little bit where you talked about, you know, that you said at, at a cost, you know, you sort of committed so much to your career that maybe you sacrificed a lot. Some of the... Some of the athletes and high performers we coach, especially the Olympic athletes, they, they literally live like monks, you know, in nine months before an Olympics, maybe 12 months before Olympics. And I'm talking, you know, don't go and see the family at Christmas because they can't risk having a cold or flu. Uh, they're in a controlled environment. They train four, six, eight hours a day. And then the rest of the day, you know, they've got their feet up on the walls, you know, venting their, venting their legs and flushing them out. Um, I think whilst in the moment that's normal, and arguably, you know, knowing what it takes for the guys to get to where they need to be, it's normal. I think that level of commitment sets athletes up for a great foundation later on in their, their next career where you're talking about find the next thing you're working towards. Because if someone said to you, Martin, can you come and do a 14-hour day? You'd be like, 
yeah, fine, no worries. Because what am I doing? Am I either talking to somebody, I'm writing an email, or I'm doing this? It's not as difficult as what I did in the past, physically and mentally stretching myself for a prolonged period of time. Is that a fair one to say? Um, I would say yes and no. Um, um, it is, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, I have only been in what could be considered a um, work environment for two years. And I, I still, to this day, I'm only doing three days a week and I still find it tough because it's something totally different to what I'm used to. You know, even now you can see me, I'm here. I've got a, a, a mat over there. I've got my dumbbells to the left of me here. And then I've got, I'm even, I've even <laughs> you might have to see, I'm even got a heart rate monitor <laughs> now. And this is me in an office environment, but I've tried to make my environment work because I, I didn't like, I was putting on weight. I couldn't be in this office environment. But, you know I mean? I know that as long as I'm watching my diet, I'm burning, you know, at least 500 calories a, a, a day. You're doing that, you know, I'm there, I'm press ups, I've got my little circuit, you know. Um, there's lots of things I'm doing after that, you know, still I'm using the same mindset that I'm using now because people say, have you got a, a, you know, have you got a desk job? I'm thinking it's all about heart rate. It's all, it's all about heart rate. Burning calories is all about heart rate. If I can get my heart rate up to a certain level, even when I'm sit, sat back, sitting down, I can, um, I can burn calories. I get up there, yeah. do, do a little circuit, you know, send an email, boom, I sit back down. And that's how I, you know, that's how my, that's how, because I am I can only do that now because I'm working at home. Probably could do that in, in the office environment. But I can still burn 700 calories in a day if I know, I've had my, you know, my herb, I don't want to go on my herb life thing, but I have my shakes, I have my diet, I watch my diet, watch what I eat, I'm burning, you know. So I'm doing, I'm in an environment which works for me. And I'm thinking no one taught me about that, taught me about that, but I've created an environment where I can be successful. And, you know, and it's, and that's all comes from passion and desire. I didn't know about any of this stuff. You know, I just know what winning looks like. You just have to set goals and know what winning looks like. And that's the mentality I think sportsmen yeah. take. Not so, cause you know, it's, it's, don't get me wrong, going into the office, being in that, in that, going in on that tube, it killed me, man. Even though I was doing it for three days a week. I was thinking, what man, I've worked, you know, because I wanted to do other things, you know, rugby gave me a good career. I've got properties, I've uh, got investments. I had enough money from my career to live for the rest of my life. But now I've got family, I've got kids who want to go to, uh, who are in um, public schools, you know, private schools. <laughs> I've got a wife, I've got, you know, stuff, you know, lots of things, you know, I want to live for a long time, you know, I want to help other people in my family. I want to do the things that maybe people who are maybe monetarily more successful than me want to do. I want to help other people. I don't want my financial situation to stop me from helping other people. You know what I mean? So you have to, so it, it makes you do, think other ways and do other things. But I always think that if I just know what success is, looks like and success for me is being in a successful company who are worth a lot of money, who are doing good things, who are putting infrastructure in the ground. So even though the technical things of it, I don't really understand, you know, and I've been involved in EV for two years now, and I'm learning more of the day about kilowatts per hour batteries and about infrastructure and all the things that, you know, that go into it. And they're far more, uh, you know, intelligent people than me. But I understand what winning looks like. And I know that with passion and desire, will and commitment, that will get me a long way. The other stuff you can <laughs> learn by being around people yeah. who know more than me, by yeah. reading stuff, uh, by <laughs> learning, you know what I mean? And uh, that, that's that's how you get by. So being a sportsman, it does give you that, that mindset of success and to know that don't let uh, the fact that you don't know what you're doing hold you back. Never let that hold no. you back. Have passion. People have, have passion and faith. If you have passion and faith, that really get that will get you a long way, you know, a long way to where I don't know, but it will get you a long way. Trust me. And that's yeah. what you have to have. You know, you have to have passion and you have to have desire. Those two things are more important than knowing what you're doing. And that might sound stupid, but that's one thing I've learned. You know, when I was 15, I didn't know. All I knew is I wanted to be the best rugby player that I was going to be and I was going to do it. I didn't have all the, I didn't know, you know, imagine that rugby league, rugby unions, amateur, uh, you know, I just had, I, you know, obviously I went off a different tangent to go play rugby league. You know, there's likes, you know, there's people that I'm jealous of the likes of people like Andy Farrell, uh, Jason Robinson, um, uh, Jonathan Davis, all these people, uh, uh, even people like people, I'm even jealous of people like John Bentley, Jim Fallon, people that some people might've said, 
you know, Jim Fallon, they might not even remember who he is. He doesn't probably have the profile, he's not as well known as me. But for me, he's a guy who, who's, um, you know, he's got cap for England. He came over to play rugby league and he got cap for England rugby union. I never got that. You know what I mean? But then that's the things that um, I thought, you know, that I, I, I didn't have. But I thought to myself, you know what? what? What all the things that you have got, you know what I mean? So yeah. that enables you to be, because you get, if you get so hung up on the things that you haven't got, as I say to my kids, you know what I mean? Like uh, they've got so much, but if one doesn't have one thing, the other's got, I have to remind them of all the things that he has, has got. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's that huge perspective again though, isn't it? That sometimes when we're engrossed in our own mind and our own thoughts, yeah, we've got to take that step back and take perspective and remember what we do have and the opportunities that are yeah, there. The opportunities that you, you, you have. And that's what the thing of being the sportsman is you like learn it, you learn. Because because of, of a sportsman, you have to learn because, you know, if you, if I score, if you score 20 goals one year, you want to score 20 goals the next year and you want to score 20 goals next year. And that's why the greatest sportsmen who we revere are all those that not the ones who have done great things, the ones who have done great things for the longest. Think yeah. of every great sportsman. It's about longevity. Mm. Isn't it? It's about re re repetition. It's about sustainability. It's about being able to do great things for the longest period. You know what I mean? There's yeah. no, there's no sportsman we, we revere who, who haven't done great things for a, a period of time. Because there's lots of people who have done one great thing, won one world championship, won one Olympic gold medal. Who are the ones we remember? The ones who have won many gold medals, aren't it? The ones who have been yeah, top that... gold scorer for more than one season. Because that is the hardest thing in life is to be to, to, to get that sustainability. And that's the thing that I got into me. And that's one reason I got into sustainability. So I thought, is that well, that's what we want to do with the planet. You know, what I was doing as an individual is to try and have to, to do great things, but to, to keep doing them and to do them in a healthy and a more healthier way. So I'm trying to, you know, whether it's my kids, whether it's what I'm doing, you know, or, or what, what I would like to have done as a sportsman is to try and put it very hard to do because you have to be, you know, um, uh, I'm trying to look at the, think of the right expression without being rude, but you've just <laughs> got to be all in. Abby. You've just got to be, you know, I was going to in. say something deep, in. <laughs> but you've just got to be all in, you know, uh, to do it. Sometimes you can't have, you, you know, your foot on the accelerator and just pump it. You've got to be, have your foot pedal to the metal, haven't you? And that's what, to, to guarantee success, that's what you have to be. Because if you do, if you just pump it a little bit and then you don't succeed, you'd be thinking, well, did I do the most I could do? You have to risk dying. That's why when sportsmen are on the on the on a pitch, you know what I mean. You you know even though on a rugby pitch, you know chances are you probably won't die, but you have to be prepared to die on that day. You know we used to call it putting your body on the line. You've got to put everything. The people who are successful are the ones who put everything on the line, aren't they? In business, it's the ones who put their house, their mortgage, you know, their everything. They put it all on the line. When you're a sportsman, you know, you go, you don't care whether you're going to blow a hamstring. You don't care whether you're going to blow a peck. You put it all on the line. You know what I mean? Like when it's weightlifted. So, you know what I mean? You're risking your body, your life. When you go out there, you know what I mean? There are people who have gone on to rugby pitch and lost their life. You know what I mean? But chances are you won't, but you've got to be prepared to, you know? Mm -hmm. I used to like when you go to, um, you know, what they used to say in the gladiators in the, in the, in the, in the, <laughs> in the Coliseums, isn't it? Those who are about to die salute you. That's, you know, it's, we used to have this um, saying when we going to test, test matches, hit the beach, like in Normandy, when they were hitting the beach, you know, you knew your life was on the line. And that is the mentality that you have to have when you go into everything. You've got to put it all on the line. And so those are the, the things that you learn as a sportsman. You know, you're putting your life on the line. You're putting your sanity on the line. You're putting the fact that people don't tell you that when you go, when you become a professional sportsman, yes, there's that drop off at the end of the cliff. When it's it, you know, one day I was a professional sportsman, the next day, I was out the club, I'm on my own, you know, all I've got is what the money I've earned, you know, the jerseys I've got, the medals I've got, and that's it. There's no club, you know, that, that now they pay, you know, uh, piecemeal, you know, they put you on courses and they help you out a little bit more. And there's charities like Rugby League Cares who help you out. But in my day, it was literally like, one day I was employed, imagine this, one day I'm employed, I get injured playing for Wasps, wasps against um, uh, Sale, scored two tries that day. I, I, uh, I, I think I cracked my back muscle. So I'm in hospital the next couple of days. Uh, I don't think I've even got a uh, medical policy anymore. I've got no contract. I'm rehabbing myself. I'm playing PlayStation, wondering what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. That's it. No more wages coming in. You're on your own. Go. Yeah. 
that's that's what that's and that's how I've created the rest of my life. And now I, so I start thinking about new things. What do I want to do? I want to have fun with the rest of my life. I want to do something I'm passionate about. I'm this I've got into acting. I've got into the whole reality TV um, uh, thing. Did you know? Um, team reality TV shows over the last. Well, I've forgotten the number of reality TV shows. Thankfully, got a break on Strictly Come Dancing. You now more recently than Hunted, Splash, Weakest Link, Come Die With Me, uh, <laughs> Total Wipeout. Just umpteen shows. You know what I mean? That that thankfully you know, doing strictly. Now I'm getting into investments and uh, property and doing sustainability, creating myself just with the same mindset of passion and desire and uh, being brave and having a will and trying this. And don't get me wrong, it's not all been success. You know, I've lost money, far more you know, far, uh, money than I would like to even admit that I've lost in investments. But, you know, you can't let that, you know, make you gun shy. You've still got to go on to the next one and, and keep mm. doing things and, and learning from that and maybe not being as cavalier and doing things. But while also having a great life, and enjoying yourself. Let's not forget that. That's what you have to do. You have to enjoy yourself. Even when I'm doing workout classes, um, I do Zoom workout classes because um, um, I'm part of this whole Herbalife thing as well, which Jamie Bolsh and Kieran Bracken and Adam Jamili bought me. You know, just being around people. One of the, if you, the two things I can have for life of success is having passion. Yes, being hard to, to, to you know, being able to um, um, work hard, but just simple thing I would give to people be close to people who are who are doing good things or that you want to do you know ingratiate yourself you know ingratiate yourself with, with them you know get close to them speak to them because that's all, all part of it as well which, which people don't realize you know if, if you're if I'm in a room with a lot of intelligent businessmen something's going to rub off if I just spend time with them you know what I mean yeah definitely. over a period of time that is going to come off just little things can change your life it doesn't have to you don't have to like um you know buy it all off that's why people say little things like you know um, don't buy it off more than you can chew just a little bit just change your life a little bit just do little things and I find all those things you know just being around you has opened up my, my mindset and my world to so many things you know what I mean being just just little things that I've taken and just learn little things like <laughs> double binds which I use with my kids <laughs> now so many times do you want to go to bed at nine or eight when I want them to go to bed at nine. You know what I mean? It's just like little things like that you learn. And just all those little things added together is going to make you happier, uh, more successful, you know, regardless of whatever you know. And that's just being around great people who are intelligent, who are into the things that you are uh, learning things. You know, if someone, you know, sends me, I always do that to people. I always send them like, even if it's little um, clips about Jim Rome and stuff like that. And then people say, I've oh, listened to this. I just changed my life because I've taken one thing out of it and that is if I'm in a rut change something I don't know what it is just a little thing if I get up at eight o'clock try to get up at seven o'clock that's one little thing you've changed from now on I get up at seven o'clock and see if that changes your life read one page of a book every day just not or, or, or one thing take try and find one little motto and try and see the meaning of it and everything else in your life has changed uh, sorry it's the same but just that one little thing has changed and just little things like that, just work, you know, which you can spoon food, spoon feed to people, and that that helps them. And that because it's kind of funny, I'm learning now about all the things that I did that I didn't know that I was doing when I was successful. Because yeah. I always think that in life, right before anyone wrote the manual, you know, people still wash clothes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Before anyone wrote the manual of anything, people still did it. So I was doing things before they wrote the manuals. And that's why when I was back, you know, like, you know, like when I talked about the, the training camps and I was going and doing, that's why, and that's what the meaning, but I think people say he was ahead of his time. That's what I didn't I don't know what that meant. People said that, but I didn't really know what that meant. Yeah. But when, what that actually means, because when you have to break, because when people say things, they make sense. You haven't really broken it down into the, it's, core components, mm -hmm. but when Pop Silver says ahead of his time, it was like, he was doing things and he, he had a mindset that people around about that time didn't have. That's what they mean when he was ahead of time. He's actually doing things that everyone around him who are doing the same job didn't weren't doing. You know what I mean? So now yeah. I'm in an office environment. I think about myself, why don't, because obviously people go to the gym at lunchtime or they go uh, here, you know, obviously, but because of there was lockdown and um, there was no gyms and there was no things, I was just thought sort of, why do, do you not have the, your, you know, you've got space, if you've got an office, why don't you just have it in your office, you know, incorporate it into your day. The minute you feel a bit of stress, just go, and, you've got your mat there, go do 20 press ups, go, you, my mind is a lot clearer, just walk outside for five minutes, walk around the block, come down, just little things like that. 
keeps helps you with your burnout, you know what I mean? Because I just thought to myself, I was feeling a little bit stressed in my environment because I just think I wasn't used to being in that environment, but I was trying to say, okay, well, I'll try and make that environment work for me. So now I'm, I'm up, but you can see I'm passionate, I'm bubbly, I'm talking, because my heart rate is, <laughs> if I check it on my phone. I think, <laughs> I think you've burned 500 calories on this podcast. <laughs> you know what I mean? My, my, my little weights are here. You know I mean? Yes, he's off, better by Seth Cole. Well, my little weights are here, just little things like that. You know what I mean? Little things you can change. Just think of things, of, because all those little things add up to a big thing. That's they what do, people yeah. realise. Add, add up to a big thing. And it just like, you know, don't get me wrong. It is more than that. You know what I mean? Because, and I do have a background in it. And I do, you know, obviously people say, oh yeah, there's lots of, and lots of reasons why people will say the things they do. And obviously the people are going to say lots of negative things. I get that. Or they try and qualify things, you know, like saying, oh, Martin was only good at rugby because he was fast. That's just other people trying to justify, you know, why they're not successful. And, and or, or Martin, it's because they don't know. They, yeah. they, that, that's all they see from their blink of view. They just yeah. see you faster than everybody else. But I'll tell, tell you what, I'll tell you what I, I might be getting a bit too deep now. And I hope, you know, please stop me if, you were, if, if I am. Because, you know, I, I, I do believe back in the, the beginning of time, or when I say beginning of time, in many hundreds and hundreds of years ago, there was a, a major lie told. And I think that's why... Um, you know, we've got this whole, obviously, Black Lives Matter thing at the moment. And I do believe, and this is, you know, and I'm open to, to discuss this with anybody. And I do believe that there was a lie told about black people many, many, many years ago. OK. And that lie was told to justify slavery. OK. And that is that black people are inferior. And that, and then, so when black people advance and they have their successes, then people, you have to tell another lie to justify. And that's one of the things that people tell another lie to justify the original lie that instead of just like letting things go and being honest and say, we're all individuals in this world. Some are good, some are bad, some are strong, some are, you know, and that's, and, and we're all people and that's it, you know? And I just do think that, and that's why it is now. And sometimes it, it used to affect me, people would say, that, oh, he's only good at rugby because he's fast. You know, they, it's, it's like they, they have to justify my success by saying it's only because of that, you know what I mean? Yeah, they or, discount it rather than saying, you know, he does this on top of that. Yeah, and so, instead, instead of just saying he's great, they can't say, instead of saying he's great, they'll just say, oh, he only scored 500 tries because he's fast. Or, or he's, you know what I mean? Or, 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 you know, and so we're all, we're all a product of that. Like, and it, and it, it's not our fault. It's just because, and sometimes we, 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 we are brought into it. It's just, it's because of the world that we came to. We didn't create this world. This great world was created for us. All we can do, and I know I'm preaching here a bit, but all we can do is like leave it, do the things that we can do and leave it in a better place. And I feel by, by doing the things that I've done and having the success I have, and, you know, giving it a bit of a platform and trying to be good and help other people regardless of whatever, you know, of, you know, that's why I love someone like Nelson Mandela. And he, I think he's one, one of the great people, Martin Luther King, who have done so much for this world. And I say, I'm getting preached in now because I'm getting it. But I'm saying because they endured so much negativity and still yeah. gave positivity to the world. Yeah, and I yeah. say that, you know, like, I, and, and I'm not putting myself on their level. Anything. I'm just saying that we're all individuals and every human does that in their own way, you know what I mean? Whether you're Nelson Mandela or whether you're working in the local fishmongers and, you know, you you had abuse when you were working there and then you went on to, um, you know, do great things. You managed, you bought that, you know, that, that fishmongers or whatever it was and you went on to maybe, I don't know, employ the son of the person who abused you. You know, whatever your story is, that's what it is. And I think that's what truly life is about. It's about making this world a better place. And I think that's the the journey that I think I'm on, you know, and that's why back then, back then I was, I, I didn't really get it. You know, I didn't really get it, but I just, I was just striving, even I said in, in front of the negativity and I get people who are today uh, send me messages on on on, uh, on Twitter and say, uh, ap literally apologize for abusing me back in the eighties. Cause it was a different world we were living on back then. But you know what I mean? And, but I believe that it made me more successful, as I say, because it was a negative world. It was almost like I, I, I was meant for that world, you know, I was meant to do that, to bring positivity, positivity when it was negativity, or just maybe it was just the way that I, it was just the world, world that I was in. And as they say, it's not what happens to you, it's how you react to the things that happen to you. Maybe I was just adapting to the environment that I was in. And I made it a, a success, you know what I mean? I, and if, if you hadn't responded the way you did in, in terms of showing them with your performance, yeah. you wouldn't be here 20 years later getting messages apologising. Apologising. So, if, so, so, if you let it get to you and didn't perform, then you wouldn't be doing what you're doing now. 
that's what I mean. I could have, I could have, there's so many, there's so many, um, I remember just one, just one throwaway experience. I think I was playing for Witness against Warrington and I was walking out to the, to, to, to the game and I was actually playing as a team who had another black player on the other side, Des, Des Drummond. So I played for Witness against Warrington and I just remember walking out and then one uh, Warrington fan just came and just held the biggest gob in my face, okay? And I just thought, wow, I'm not having that. So I just thought, man, I'm just gonna go out and I'm just gonna, you know, I'm, the way I'm gonna show them is by going out. And I, I remember, I think I scored five tries on that day, did so well, but you know, and I just, I just thought to myself, I took it with pride. I could have done what Eric Cantona did, you know? And I think mm. to myself, imagine that if a lot of black players did what Eric Cantona did, you know what I mean? I just lashed out and, and, and in the face of negativity, showed more negativity, that would make the world more negative. And that, you know, you, there would be more negativity in the world because even if you've got negative, you can't fight, you know? Two wrongs don't make a right, and all these other things that come out. And I, just, I and even, without even knowing all these things, I was just doing that. I just thought that's the way I'm going to fight back. That's what I'm going to do because I thought it's going to be for the betterment of me. You know what I mean? And, and that's what I'm doing. I so, do so in that moment, Demar, let's have a look at that. So there's one example there. So what I think you've got two options. Some well, three probably. Yeah. So you've got freeze, fight, or flight, haven't you? So so yeah. you know, Cantona has gone out of fight because yeah. he's lost it and it, let's be honest that wouldn't have been the first time that happened to him yeah. that's that's happened because you know there's there's loads of mitigating you yeah. either freeze and not perform or you stand yeah. up to it so can you can, can you describe to us what what it was physically like for you at that time so obviously that horrendous things it's happened is it is it then it's like so like do you stand up bigger than yourself go right i'll show you hey. here's in your neck standing up you like it fueled me. It yeah. fueled me because I know because I I, I challenged myself, isn't it? And it's like uh, it's something I learned a bit later because I you know a bit later on in life I, I, I suffered from a bit of anxiety, uh, you know I certainly didn't like public speaking <laughs> and different things. And but I think it was something that I learned on a course when I was when I was with you, and um, just it is that you know whether it's you know. Uh, that anxiety it's the same emotion that you feel and it's just how your body responds to the the, the same stimulus. Yeah. And because of, you know, the tricks you play with your mind, that just, you manifest it as a positive or a negative. And some people, two people are stimulated the same way, but there's, but there you get a different reaction from them. One, it's a negative, as you say, they go into the shell, but some, for some reason that just spurred me on. So the more negativity they throwed me at, the bigger I was, they didn't realize they were fueling me. And that's why I went on to, to create this thing. I created this persona, I became, I became larger than life. I, I did feel like sometimes I was in, I was, you know, been transported. And so when I was in big games, it was like, this is big game time. I just like, I just, I just love that adversary, you know, that, that, that competition, you know, it was, you were either red or you're blue and it was tribal and it was like, fight it was just very primitive and I walked out there and the, the crowd oh man I'm thinking about it now and I'm thinking that if you can get into that situation that is you know when you take that away from somebody that's why you have the drop off yeah that's where the drop it's off it's addictive though isn't it that adrenaline level of adrenaline is yeah. addictive so don't get me wrong it's not as it's you no know, any nothing is going to come close to that and you have to accept that but things that we do now you know, I, I DJ and you know, I be for I have ex wonderful experiences I do things you know and uh, and I talk to people and even now this is the closest I'm going to get and I and I'm uh, you know I watch my old clips because they put me into that mindset and I love it when people still buzz off those clips they stand the test of time I can put a clip up on YouTube that is 30 years old, okay? And somebody who's never seen it can still say it and go, wow, and message me. I'd buzz off that as well, you know what yeah. I mean? And it's like, you, you kind of, you find a way to, 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 to keep going on. Yeah, and I, I think as well, I was watching your um, your Insta or your, your Facebook videos of when you're recording your, your boys either playing football or rugby and you're commentating or a goal goes in. That's, yeah. you, buzz, that's you buzzing as well. <laughs> that's me buzzing as well, you know what I mean? It's on their little journeys because I know whether I see my son, you know, what say one plays rugby, uh, one uh, is more into football now, even though he's still still playing a bit of rugby. But you know, when I I'll buzz off as much seeing them play in a in a kids game as one day if I ever got to see them play in any big game. You know what I mean? Because you've got to enjoy that journey, and every moment is you cherish it. You know, yeah. it's special, and that's yeah. something I've 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 learned. Every moment is 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 truly special. And maybe when I was as young, I didn't realize that, and maybe it took me going into you know becoming a professional sportsman going on to play, you know, in Australia in front of 50, 60,000 people to realise that, you know, when I scored a try at school, you know, that was just as special and to cherish every moment and then to keep on that journey, you know, and that's what you kind of, you learn that as you get older and any achievement is to celebrate your achievements, you know, even if it's, you know, 
I think uh, when I um, I used to have this bad habit from boarding school, which was uh, uh, eating at night. <laughs> I don't know why I got it, but I used to eat at night. And uh, I remember after my first child was born, my missus would say, why are you getting up in the middle of the night, scoffing biscuits and stuff like that? It was a terrible habit. Gave me bad teeth and whatever, but it's something that I've done from boarding school. And then I just thought to myself, you know, I don't need to do that anymore. Why am I doing that? But I just, you know, something's become a habit and you've got all these things and sometimes it takes somebody else to look look at you. And then, you know, instead of getting defensive, you know, you're just open to it. If someone's, you know, if someone gives you feedback, you know, try and take it in the manner that it, it's been given to you. And that's a tough skill to take, to learn as well. It is for sure. Yeah, for sure. If you can, if you can take feedback, all right, because even my wife, she gives good it, but she's not very good at taking it. But she's, she's as you know, <laughs> which can lead to a bit of, um, you know, in marriages, we go on to, <laughs> you know, can lead to a lot of friction in marriages. But if you can take the feedback in the, in the, in, in, with the love that is given, then, you know what I mean? That, so I realised also that is so great that if someone can give it to me, that I'm going to be in a better position than her. If I can take feedback and, um, you know, and somebody else can't take the feedback, you're, you're in a better position. So I, I, I don't get angry because some people get angry. Go, well, I, you know, I listen to everything you say, but you don't listen to what I say, but you've got to say you're the better person because you're growing. Because yeah. if that's good feedback and then I don't eat anymore and I give her some feedback, she doesn't take it and she stays in that same mindset, then who's better? Who's, who's, better, who's winning? I'm winning because I'm more open. I can take quality feedback. I can process it, yeah. see actually if it is going to make me better. And if I think, yeah, you know what? You are actually right <laughs> you know don't you know that's why i say be a student not a follower i always say that because um that's something i'm quoting jim Rohn there really it's not me but it's just something that i always knew that if you can take good feedback you know and that feedback can be something from you as well by as i used to do i used to watch ellery hanley i used to watch sean edwards and i should see everything they do you know have confidence in myself and know that i'm better than them physically in the sense that i can run faster than them, them and i can be just as fit as them that's going to make me better because god bless with that speed so if i can learn to do the things that they can do that that is another feed you know i'm it's literally learning but i'm getting feedback i'm getting feedback by just watching them it's not them coming up to me and saying that they're telling that to me by by me watching them Ellery Hanna used to do this thing and the, uh, if you go and watch I think it's the 1987 Challenge Cup final Ellery Hanna scores a try under the post it's in I think it's in my book and he scores a try by running across the pitch okay he's literally running at a diagonal if he'd have run straight he would have got tackled but he ran diagonal I don't know where he learned that from because I've not spoken to Ellery Hanna about it but I don't know where he learned that from but I, when I watched that, I learned that he was just like, hey, if you run across in a diagonal, it's harder p- for someone to catch you because then they have to change their direction. They miss a step and just little things like that. And I'm just thinking, are people who are just your everyday sportsmen, are they thinking on that level? Are they thinking on that level of greatness when they've got, you've got everything at the bottom, yeah? You're fast, you've got, you're big, you've got big muscle, you've trained, you've, uh, you practice. 100 passes if you left, you packed 100 passes if you left. But are you going into that cerebral level of that, of learning these things that are going to make you really great? And they're going to, when you put them all together on that big occasion, which you might only get four of in your life, you know, or three of, are you going to be in four World Cup finals? Are you going to be in, you know, four Olympic finals? Are you going to be in four FA Cup finals? Are you going to be in four Champions League deciders? You know, are those big ones, those what I call, um, career defining positions or environments, you know, games, because they don't come every day. You know, yeah. you work for, you know, as you say, people work for them, but it could be, you know, in that position where it's going to be into, you know, getting that promotion, you've worked all this year and this is the deal. Are you going to secure that one deal that's going to make your boss think, oh, this guy's the right guy for me to promote. This guy's the right guy for me to go into business. You know, you work and work and work. When you, everyone knows all them career defining moments. You can look back at your career and think of those special times or things that can happen, or you think, yeah, that's that. And uh, you know, that, that's are you at that kind of are you at that kind of level? And sometimes, you know, I was at that level, but I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what I was mm-hmm. doing. I couldn't, um, you know, write it in a book. You know, I didn't have the intelligence. I just, I, I don't know why. I think it's just organically within our, in all of us as human beings. And that's why some people think wrongly, let me t- tell you, but think they are special. But we're, we're not, we're all special. That is, that's another lie, okay? We talked about lies. We all, black, white, Hispanic, uh, you know, we all, we're all special, but we just have to find it. 
We just have to find it. And I, I, it's kind of weird when I'm saying it, but everyone knows it. You know, we're all special. And that, but just only when you find it, you think it's because you think that you're, you know, it's just you when you're on that. And yeah, it, it's 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 easy. It's an easy trap to fall into. You know what I mean? We all. The, I actually thought it. You know, sometimes I do that, but it's not. It's not. It's just that everyone, every human being has it, but not everyone taps into it. No, and I think you know the the big one word that come out there is you know the, the opportunity and being the you know being willing and brave enough to to have a go where that opportunity arises. And I think also maybe some of the ones that maybe missed an opportunity or didn't take that opportunity, you, you kick yourselves for it, but don't let it hold you back because yeah. get your head facing forward and another one will come along. But I'm conscious, mate. We we could talk for hours about I, I the forward mindset. No, I know we've done it before and we'll do it again, no doubt. Yes. But, but what I'd like to really plug into, pun intended, was. Um, your venture now, what you're up to for the last couple of years around this EV, and tell us tell us a little about it from a, a layman's term. So what is it, what it's all about? Because I think it, it really nicely knits together your passion for sustainability. Um, yes, as I say, it was just a, a chance meeting. So also, I always think that certain things are meant to happen. You know, you're meant to meet the, 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 the right people. You're meant to um, uh, be in certain places at the right time. And then sometimes it used to like freak me out a bit because I couldn't, I couldn't, um, you know, sometimes I, it would get beyond me. And I know you can open up your mind sometimes and sometimes open up your mind's a scary thing sometimes. And then you want to control it and stay, you know, and, and, and be in control of it. And that's what we do. And sometimes you have to be brave and just give yourself to it. But it is, a, it is scary sometimes, you know what I mean? Cause you just go up there and you do it, but you know, it just, EB was just meant to happen for me. You know, somebody gave me a lift. Uh, um, Andy Gomesall, uh, who's a, another rugby player, gave me a lift in an EV in 2016. I was at the Cheltenham Gold Cup. I thought, you know, what is, what is, what is this EV? It was a great ride, you know what I mean? In the sense that, wow. So, so when you say EV, electronic vehicle, right? Yeah, electric vehicle, uh, yeah, yeah. Electric vehicle. And, you know, anyone who's been in an electric vehicle knows that it's got an incredible amount of torque. And then you, um, uh, when you go in it, you're like, wow. And then you like, it's like it was excited, right? I thought, what is this thing? He said, oh, it's, it's, it was an I3. So I thought, God, I started to do a bit of investigating into it. And I, so I got my wife one in 2017. And then um, I had a, a Range Rover and I thought to myself, you know, God, I pay a hundred pounds in polluting uh, diesel to drive this Range Rover. Whereas you've got this clean technology and it costs two pound 50. I thought, it's a no brainer. I'll get my, you know, so I used to just drive my wife's car all the time. And she used to say, where's my car? Because she didn't want to use the, the, the Range Rover because whoever drove the Range Rover had to put a hundred pound in it <laughs> to fill it up. So it was just a natural thing to go and use the, um, to go and use the EV. So we used to use it as our family car all the time. And the, the Range Rover was just, nobody wanted to drive it. You know, it's clean, it's, it's, it's great for the environment, you know, clean air, it's cheap to use. There were so many subsidies, it was just a no brainer. And then until I wanted to go beyond the range of the vehicle, because the i3 could only do 100 miles. And then when I went to try and drive from London to Bath, which is only 10 miles beyond the range of the, the, the i3, then I, I thought to myself, God, what the hell is this? I couldn't find a charger anywhere. Uh, you know, it just, it was just a, you know, uh, range anxiety does exist. Let me tell you, trying to find the infrastructure to charge it. And I thought, this is no good, can't have this. So we kept the, the I3 just for short journeys. As long as we didn't go beyond the range of the car, I could get a, a government grant, get a charger on my driveway. It was, it was perfect. As long as I don't go beyond the hundred mile range, you know, there and back, then the I3 was great. So then I, I did a bit more investigation, found out about this company called Tesla. This is, you know, when no one really knew what Teslas were. I'm talking about uh, 2017, just going into 18. Uh, only uh, not that long ago, but you know, still, you know, it was still new. Most people didn't really know what electric vehicles were, even in 2018. And found out about their infrastructure, superchargers. So, uh, you know, it was a little bit of a barrier to entry because um, um, Teslas are quite expensive, but, you know, I managed to secure uh, an older one for um, a reasonable price. And then it just opened up the whole world to us, you know, with regard to traveling. Um, we drove to Biritz, drove all over um, uh, the UK, you know, because they had the superchargers. So I thought if everyone has the same, you know, uh, has the same um, infrastructure to use, you know, i.e. what I've got at home, what I've got at the gym, plus the arterial um, network, then this is a no brainer. We should all be driving EVs. And then just it just worked out. 
that similar time, a friend of mine, a guy called Richard Clements, uh, was part of um, a founding team who, who, who founded a company called Connected Curve, who were putting infrastructure in the ground for people without driveways who didn't have, you know, I've got a driveway, so I could every morning, you know, all my cars have um, a full tank of electricity. But if you are charging on street, I, you know, you lived in a flat or a terraced house, then you, you, there was nowhere for you to charge charge it so we we connect a curb put power and data into the with electric vehicle chargers into the curb side so we um provide that charging infrastructure for people uh without driveways and uh you know we also put them into stadiums into lots of places because what people don't realize is that 95 percent of the time your lifetime of your car from where you um where it gets made to where it's scrapped it's stationary so it just makes sense to charge that car where it is stationary. Yes, you need um, uh, arterial charging and destination charging and charging lots of different places when you're going along journeys, but it just makes sense to charge your car where it's stationary. Because even if it's a fast charger, if I have to go to travel, even if it's only a 10 minute drive to, to go there, and even if it only takes me half an hour, that's 50 minutes. What's the point of me doing that when I, if I could just charge it where it's stationary. It's stationary for 95% of the time. So it just, you know, just these simple things, it makes sense to charge it where, where it's stationary. So that's the philosophy of Keptic Curve. It's cheaper, um, it's, it's, it's uh, better for the environment because we know that EVs are better for the environment, but it's also the infrastructure that you're putting in the ground should be sustainable. I, it's got, should be there for a long period of time. It should be made from recyclable materials. And just everything about the, the ethos of Connected Curve was, was sustainable. It was a no brainer. So the, when the opportunity came to get in, involved with a company like that on the, uh, on, the, on the ground floor, I just thought, wow, you know what I mean? I was just, it was just like a, a second coming. It was something I could get passionate about. It's something that I would get up and go to an office for. I would go and make those drives. So even though going into an office environment, as I say, even though I was doing it three days a week, still it was, it was foreign to me. I was just like looking at everyone on the tube thinking, is this what my life's come to now that I'm going, I'm, I'm a commuter? You know, when you're a sportsman, these are all the things that you, you think to yourself, at least I don't have to, I'm not doing that, you know? You're blessed, you know, there are maybe some negatives about getting injury, getting injured and having operations and, you know, and, you know, retiring, maybe your prime, you know, a lot of things they don't tell you about when you become a professional sportsman, you know? <laughs> it's not said on the, the brochure at the beginning. Yeah, you're gonna, you know, be adored and you're gonna play in Challenge Cup finals or whatever, but there's also this, <laughs> yeah? There's certain things that go written which you have to learn about, but, um, you know, when I was uh, going out, but I thought to myself, this is something I'm passionate about, you know, I can get involved in, you know, so I have been a champion for EV, you know, I know that the government have moved the ice car ban, you know, ban on the sale of new electric, oh, sorry, new um, um, petrol and diesel cars from, you know, um, 2040 to 2035, and now to 2030, you know, so th it's coming, you know, so I mean, yeah, yeah. we're trying to remove that inertia to get the ball rolling, to get everyone to, uh, to make that pledge that if you're not driving an EV now, make your next car an EV. There are so many reasons which I, I won't have to go into now, but you can connect with me on at www.connectedcurve.com or my LinkedIn page or my Instagram page and find out more about, find out more about um, EVs and electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Cause you know, you know, if it's, if you're not passionate about it, you should be, cause it's about the planet. I know that people, you know, maybe talk about Greta Thunberg and, you know, and the, the, the negative sides of, 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 of sustainability. But, you know, it, if you, if something is not sustainable, it's not something you should be involved in really, because, you know, whether it's your body, your mindset or the planet as a whole, or you, even your finances, it's all yeah. got to be sustainable, isn't it? If you're, even as a company, if you're, you know, you're selling or, you know, you're, you're spending more than you're, than you're making, that's not sustainable, you know? Even in relationships, everything's got to be sustainable in, in life. And that's something that, that I've learned and something that I live by. Brilliant, mate. And, and I think that it's, it's definitely sparked the curiosity for me to look a little bit more. And again, as you were chatting, I was thinking, you know, a couple of months ago, I was, um, I was lucky enough to take an afternoon off and go and play, play some golf with my mates. And I, I was really surprised by the amount of electric cars in the golf car park. They're, 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 I wouldn't even say they're coming. I say they're here. They're just going to expand even more. And what I'll do is, wherever people are listening to this podcast, I'll put the links below for for your LinkedIn page, for your website, etc. So people can go and go and research that. Right. To be able to wrap this up, then quick fire questions. Only four or five questions. Let's let's see how quickly you can answer them. So, Martin or Fire, your number one sporting role model. Oh, I'd have to say Muhammad Ali. Oh, amazing. Great choice. Your non-sporting role model. 
my non-sporting well, no, it'd have to be the guy I was named after Martin Luther King I'd say oh, amazing for another little bit of information like that um, you've touched on a lot of them but what's your number one proudest moment my number one proudest moment wow wow personal I, you know it's kind of funny because even when I try to search for other things, it's just that it's defined for you. You know what I mean? It's going to be that scoring that try at Wembley in 1994 because I think it put me onto a certain platform, enabled me to touch a lot of people uh, metaphorically in the sense that um, it meant so much not only to me because I achieved a goal I'd set for myself. And um, I don't know, it helped get away maybe so many demons for me. And, you know, that's when I had that moment and I just knew that it's going to be something that I'm going to be remembered for. You know, if I'm remembered for anything in, you know, 20, 30 years after I'm gone, it's going to be that. So I'd have to say that. Brilliant. And linked to that then. So you've got both of these, but you're only allowed to choose one. Is it the MBE or is it a statue at Wembley? A statue at Wembley. Without <laughs> because, um, you know, medals and money and uh, certificates, uh, those are things that are defined by eras, you know, um, you know, MBEs mean something now, but they probably didn't mean that much maybe in caveman times, and they might not mean so much in the Star Trek era in the future. But I think statues and, 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 and things like that are something that I think, um, uh, you know, span consciousness, you know, whether effigies or worshipping or you know things like that so to have something like that you know doesn't matter what time you're in somebody could come from mars in a million years and they'll see a statue of me and they'll try to understand because it's a human being in a pose that meant something and they'll try to understand that and yeah. things like that i think uh transcendent and i think the beauty of it as well is, is obviously it's at the new wembley so it's not going anywhere anytime soon that's for sure so i think whether it's going somewhere or not you've got to put it somewhere or you should yeah. not down it becomes something else so you know hopefully 40 years from now it's not in your back garden <laughs> right two last two ones then what's your future goal big 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 goal my future goal is to see everyone driving evs in the whole country that's my goal brilliant and on a personal level slightly linked to the last one if you had one wish right now that could come true what would it be I could see one day into the future. Ah, amazing. I'll tell you what, a link to that. I watched the movie Tenet last night. Have you seen that? Oh, it's mind-blowing. There's a movie called Tenet where they, they can move backwards in time and all that to the point yeah. where it lost me. So uh, make sure you train for that and you're well-skilled. But anyway, Martin, as always, thanks very much for your time. Um, again, we've, we've talked way more than we planned to. I really appreciate your time. It's been fantastic. And uh, I'm sure everybody listening to this podcast, whatever they are, will be really grateful of your, your openness and your honesty as always. My pleasure.